Great. And Corinda, have you started the video or will I do it from this end? If you can do it from that end, that would be marvellous. No, I can't. It's been stopped. Here we go. Ask to start video. Thank you. And then I'll start my video. No? Okay. Here we go. Can people now see me? Don't we just love technology? <laughs> in 2020, I was doing this um, for a, a session actually in Darwin this morning and we had, it, I think we've all, become, we've all learned how best to handle the stress of technology sometimes not working. But look, could I just welcome everybody this afternoon to this webinar and just say thank you so much for your interest and your time. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which we all are meeting today and that is many. Here in Canberra, it is the land of the Ngunnawal people, um, and I acknowledge them as the traditional owners, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and extend that respect to elders from all places where we are meeting. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to all of you um, who have had some experience of the reality of mental health and potentially suicide risk challenges. Um, thank you. We acknowledge your, the value of your experience and what we need to learn from it. And thank you in particular for being here, as I say, for Vision 2030. Uh, Corinne, if you can take us through to the next slide, I'll just start to put in context what we're looking at doing this afternoon. So where we will land on this at the end of it, obviously with this webinar, is to be, have the opportunity to pass information to you. And what Francis, Karina and I would really like by the end of this, this time is that your interest has not only been engaged, but you're seeing that for us to really take this forward and be successful about it, we need your help. Um, but to do that, firstly, I thought it might be useful to put Vision 2030 in 2020 into some sort of context. And you can't even begin to talk about 2020 without realising just all of those things that have been happening to us at a kind of environmental and reality level this year. I mean, really, we, were, we came off the back end of seven to 10 years of one of the worst drought seasons that our generations have ever experienced. And what an impact that was already having on our mental health. We then went across into those horrific bushfires, um, the severity of which I think went beyond anything that any of us had ever experienced. And the impact was quite incredible. And I remember coming out of those bushfire seasons in about January and hearing from so many people that what got them through was their ability to, to connect with their neighbours and to be part of their community. We then tip across into COVID-19. And oh gosh, that's just turned everything on its head um, in terms of every aspect of our life, how we live, how we work, and most significantly, how we can even relate to each other. And that very physical connectedness that was so important for those who went through the bushfires has now been turned on its head. And we, whilst we absolutely, all of us, I believe, understand the importance of social connectedness, we're needing to do it with physical distancing and what a challenge that is. The impact that COVID-19 and the way we've had to deal with it on our mental health and wellbeing has really been significant and it's not ending. If anything, we're seeing increased presentations of people coming into the system saying we need help for a whole range of mental health illnesses from psychological distress, anxiety, uh, depression, through to the ongoing impact for those of us who have complex, severe, serious, long-term mental illnesses. Uh, we're seeing increased numbers of people coming forward and we are finding that so many parts of our lives are impacted by it. However, what we're also seeing um, is at a time when I think most of you will, will know just the degree of mental health reform that has been going on for years now, but is, I think is in a number of ways starting to come to the head through the Productivity Commission and the Royal Commission in Victoria and the Royal Commission into Aged Care, etc. cetera. Um, in that, busy space and in the reality of all that's been happening in 2020, we're actually seeing a few changes into, and I think they're positive changes, changes in terms of a more collaborative approach amongst governments. The mere fact that today here in Canberra, we had national cabinet meeting again, with the challenges that go with all jurisdictions coming together, but national cabinet now exists. Um, 
we are looking to streamline, Cabinet's looking to streamline all of the government bureaucratic purpose, uh, processes for the purpose of trying to do things more agilely, in a way that's more connected, in a way that we believe, and certainly they are saying, should deliver real benefit to Australians in a faster, more integrated way. We've done that through COVID-19, sometimes with lumps and bumps, but it has been done. The challenge now, I think the opportunity, is to pick that up and carry it forward. And into this space fits Vision 2030. So Karina, could we go to the next slide? So Vision 2030, when did this come about? Well, in fact, the idea for it started um, well over two and a half, almost three years ago now. Um, right after the appointment of Minister Hunt as, um, Hunt, sorry, as Minister, Federal Minister for Health. And he was meeting with a group of stakeholders in Victoria and we were talking about what's working in the system, what's not. And somebody said, well, look, why don't we actually look to, what does it look like if it's successful? And we all kind of stopped and thought, wouldn't that be an interesting challenge? So what the Minister asked the um, National Mental Health Commission to do was to actually do that. He said, tell me what the vision is for a mental health and suicide prevention system that works, whatever that may mean. So in 2019, when I joined the commission and, and we really kind of picked this up and said, okay, what are we going to do with it? Um, we certainly took that challenge on, but in conversation with him, it was very much around the fact, and this was something that Certainly I felt strongly, and, and I know that Francis and Karina and Alicia and the others in the team feel incredibly deeply, is that if it's going to be a vision for what works for Australia's mental health and suicide prevention system, then it must, must, must not be a top-down vision. This has to be well and truly informed by those who use the system, whether it's a service provider or somebody who uses it um, for, for their own needs. We must consult with them. So. Uh, right back in June, July of 2019, when we uh, commenced with the Connections Project, which Francis will pick up and go through in some detail, it was very much a case of two ears, two eyes, one mouth. We wanted to see the reality, so we actually went out to visit communities in Australia. We wanted to hear what people had to say, so we, we met with them in town hall settings, in general meeting settings and through surveys. Um, and then we tried to distill that back down um, and do an analysis of what we were really hearing. And then as we take it forward, this is about maintaining that partnership with service users, but also expanding it out so that we can ensure that the jurisdictions in which our system operates, which is every jurisdiction in Australia, has engagement with what we're trying to do. Next slide, thanks, Karina. So there's a lot already happening. And we've put this into three kind of cogs. And if you can conceptualise in the middle there what we want Vision 2030 to be is the big cog that helps it all through. So let's break it down a little bit. What is already happening? Bottom right hand corner, there's a lot of system and other reviews going on. Um, we know we have the Fifth National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Plan. Um, we know that we have, and that we, one of the things that the Mental Health Commission does is that we monitor that and we report on how that is going and all the things that need to be implemented under it. We've got the Productivity Commission and we've all seen the draft report that came out um, halfway through the year or earlier in the year and are waiting to see the final report. We have the Royal Commission um, in Victoria. Now the difference, as people are probably well aware, is the Productivity Commission looks at the system and the Royal Commission in Victoria is looking at it more through the lens of the, the user journey and what is that looking like. We've got the Aged Care Royal Commission, uh, we've got the Intergenerational Health um, Studies, etc. All of those big reviews happening. Come across onto the left hand side, we've also got some fairly targeted things that are um, busily being done in 2020. There's the Towards Zero National Suicide Prevention Plan. And most importantly, that's kind of more of a departmental one, but the next one under it, which is the National Suicide Prevention Implementation Strategy, sits in under the fifth plan. And with the mechanism by which all of the jurisdictions have come together to say, okay, suicide prevention is a priority within the fifth plan. What are we all going to do? And we are now, that, that document took some time to bring together, but has been brought together, has identified uh, 
key priority areas and key priority actions for all jurisdictions. And whilst the, the COAG process is now collapsed out, there has been approval to it from Health Council. So that is, that is a document which is still to be implemented, but has been agreed. There is the work that's been done on the National Children's Mental Health and Wellbeing Strategy, a draft of which will be delivered to the Minister later this year, and then will be open for more extensive consultation with the public. That's where we really go down into the 0 to 12 year olds and indeed into our preconception. There's the National Preventative Health Strategy. Now that sits under what's called the third pillar of the current uh, priority plans. There's four pillars to the 10-year the kind of plan that the, the Minister has launched. The first pillar looks at MBS and PBS and how we can open up that more, use that more effectively. The second relates to the intersect between public and private health. The third is around preventative health and mental health, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then the fourth is around research. So we're in that third pillar of preventative health and mental health. It's interesting to note that we're not specifically in the preventative health strategy. Um, as I have been saying to people, what that means is we will just have to ensure that in our mental health areas, we very strongly focus on prevention, which is a factor of um, Vision 2030. We have the workforce strategy, the research strategy, the suicide information initiative, which is about how can we get all the data together in a way that works properly, and a workplace initiative for mentally healthy workplaces. Then to complete all the activity, we also have over on the top right hand corner, some new initiatives which are being implemented, such as the eating disorder residentials and the adult men mental health hubs. Vision 2030 is there to try to make some strategic sense of all of this activity and propel it into a future system that is really effective for all of us. Next slide, thanks. Um, very quickly, the major components that we are looking at, the things that really need to be done through Vision 2030 following on from the consultation is we have pretty clear policy around our primary care, which is funded by Commonwealth. We have pretty clear policy and frameworks around our tertiary care, which is funded by our jurisdictions. The bit in the middle is incredibly busy. It's funded by Commonwealth, it's funded by our jurisdictions, it's, it's got NGOs in there, it's funded by philanthropy and it is very much a hodgepodge of what programs have been funded. We need to better define that, underpin it with policy. We need to define what are the essential components of care that needs to fit in there. We need to work out what are the funding mechanisms that are required. Thanks, Karina. So I, don't want, I will leave it pretty much there and then pass it across to Francis to take us through in more detail. Sorry, just go back one there, thank you. Um, Karina, just back to the last one. So, but what I was just wanting to, to finally say, because I know it's top of mind for so many people, is how does this fit in with a Productivity Commission report, which is due to be released? The Productivity Commission report does relate to our system, our mental health system, how it should be improved. It has a very natural fit with the work we're doing with Vision 2030. So when that comes out and we can really look at how the two work together, that's a critical part of our work. Just to complete with the timeline, on the next slide, we have done on the left hand side our connections project and Francis will take you through the results of that. It was a fascinating opportunity to meet with many, many of you. Uh, we then took that work and developed our draft blueprint, which we delivered to the Minister earlier this year. And we are now in the active process of, of really unbundling that to say, what would that look like? as we try and put it into a roadmap. And because it's a draft and we're going on with consultation, what will the final product look like? So we've formed a roadmap advisory committee um, and we are doing that work. Interestingly, you'll see right in the centre there, we had the opportunity as a response to uh, the pandemic to do the um, pandemic, uh, sorry, the, the National Mental Health and Wellbeing Pandemic Response Plan. That is not a reform piece of work. It's a piece of work that informs all jurisdictions and is signed by all jurisdictions as to how we respond to the pandemic. But having Vision 2030 gave us the principles framework upon which we could also then use those principles in the pandemic response plan. So Vision 2030 has been useful today, but there's a lot more to it. So Francis, perhaps I could hand across now to you and Karina to take us through in more detail. Thanks, Christine. Let me just start my video.
mostly just so that I can say hi to everybody because uh, we will actually turn off my video again. Um, I know that's going to seem a little weird. It's a little weird for me too, but it means that we can make the screen a bit bigger for you to be able to see the slides. And we have taken liberties um, with the fact that everybody is sitting in front of a screen. And so there's quite a bit of detail in some of the slides. So what Karina is going to do is turn back off my video um, so that you can see those slides more clearly. But I just wanted to uh, say hello uh, so that you could see who it was that was talking uh, before we did that. And the other thing that I just wanted to say before we start is that you can see uh, Karina mentioned the question and answer button down the bottom. We really encourage you to be asking questions. I know that uh, because of the structure that we've got at the moment um, in this webinar, we'll answer them at the end, as many as we can get to. But if you're asking questions as we go along, then it means that we can also take those questions away and answer them afterwards um, as frequently asked questions on the website. But also questions that you ask really help us to guide us in how better to uh, explain the information that we have in vision to move forwards into roadmap, which I'll talk about, um, and really guide us into what you see as priorities as well. So your questions aren't just about um, us answering them today, but we will get to answering as many as we can today as well. Well. So Karina, if you want to uh, go ahead and turn me off. Yep, perfect. Okay. And I'll just grab, uh, there we go. Perfect. So as uh, Christine said, we'll, um, we'll start with our Connections project. And Connections was really about hearing people's perspectives and hearing what the system meant for them what was going on so we did 26 town hall meetings the attendees at those meetings were mostly people who had their own experience um, either their experience with mental illness or their experience as being a carer we also held 17 stakeholder meetings so that was over uh, 1300 uh, individual attendees which ended up being over 4,000 separate points of, of information for us to analyze and come up with some consensus some themes um, I think the, uh, the, the data person in me just kind of wants to point out that we're talking um, about people who came to talk to us, people who have a story that they want to tell and their voice to be heard. Um, we know that that's not necessarily representative of the whole population, uh, but we think it's a really important voice. And so we have uh, looked at that voice thematically as we've built up from connections into vision. And so my next two slides go through what some of the findings were for that thematic analysis. So the first one was looking at barriers, <laughs> barriers to seeking help, barriers to accessing help effectively. And I think one of the things that you can see from this graph on the left is that the most common barrier raised with us was access, um, that it was uh, really troublesome to try and access care in their community, whether that's financial, uh, whether there were significant wait lists, really restrictive eligibility, so inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, transport, so geographic issues, um, and the hours of the service being really restrictive. So that was the most common, 50%. That means that one in every two people who spoke to us of those 1,300 um, said that that was a significant issue for them. And I think when you look at this graph, what you can see is that the way communities work and the way the system works um, were the issues that were most significant for people. Um, you can see service gaps um, they're at 25 percent but you know that's half of of access um, and stigma was the second most common at 41 percent uh, and in stigma we've combined a couple of things we've combined the sense of self-stigma and shame we've combined uh, stigma within a community and discrimination experienced uh, by people in their workplaces by people in accessing healthcare services uh, it was really clear in the um, people's experiences that we looked at um, when we looked at the data from these town halls that people were experiencing discrimination even in the face of a community that might have been generally more accepting or understanding. So even though there had been um, perhaps some slight improvements in general understanding for some people um, in their communities, there was still a very strong sense of that not translating to 
opportunities to meaningfully engage uh, with their communities, with their life, and, and to be able to seek care in a safe and effective way. Um, and so you can also see there, I think that safe and effective way kind of leads into the third most common barrier to seeking help there, which we've called trust. It's a group of experiences that talk about um, a lack of trust of services that are in their community, possibly due to negative experiences in the past, um, a fear of what might happen if you access care, particularly if acknowledging that you are experiencing mental ill health at the moment might have an impact on your work or your family life um, and uh, a fear around confidentiality. So whether services are able to, to maintain that confidentiality. Um, and that was particularly true in some of the more uh, regional and, and rural towns that we visited as well. Um, in the stakeholder meetings, uh, we came up with some really similar themes and, uh, around the system being the most significant barrier, the way the system um, is there for people, the way that uh, the system creates a, a cohesive community or understanding community um, beyond perhaps specific service gaps, um, which were there but very unique to each community. So you can see there um, that social is a, a shorthand on that, on that pie chart. But what that means is the most strongly identified barrier in stakeholder meetings was the experience of the people accessing their services. So a real acknowledgement of the, the social context, the social determinants of mental ill health, how issues of drug and alcohol, um, housing, employment, uh, engagement with the justice system, all of those things were huge barriers to being able to identify uh, to be able to access uh, mental health supports that were in their community um, and the appropriateness of those services. So again, that kind of comes down to the, the um, accessibility, not having services that meet your needs. Um, you can see there some of the other issues, workforce and, and the systemic and, and structural issues. Um, all of those details, also all of these details are in, um, in the uh, Vision 2030 document that's up on the website. So you can also have a little look at these uh, diagrams in more detail. The second key piece of information we looked at, what ideas for improvement were, what people wanted to see in their system going forwards. And again, I think you can really see from this slide that systemic issues were the most commonly identified ideas and there was the most consistency around those ideas um, in terms of being able to change funding, uh, workforce, being able to actually provide the services that are needed consistently, um, affordably, uh, being able to create an environment to be able to best use services that already exist, if not in that community, then somewhere. Um, community mental health services uh, was the next most common at 39%. You can see some particular types of service then around psychoeducation, social, hospital, um, and prevention coming up for town hall attendees. And in the stakeholders, again, there was it's quite a lot of consistency here um, in terms of systemic issues um, and workforce. You can see specific service initiatives there. Um, and one of the things that I think was, was really interesting about listening to um, the stories from our Connections tour was that there was a real sense of theme, a real sense of consensus around some of the systemic issues in terms of accessibility um, and workforce, coordination and being able to have uh, coordinated care, being able to access things in your own community. But there was a lot of diversity in how that translated for individual communities and what that meant in terms of specific services or initiatives. I think it really highlighted for us that there was an opportunity to look at communities separately, to be able to understand community-based needs and that they were different. We noticed that in quite often, there were similar ideas like the community mental health service that were actually translated in really different ways. So for some people that might have been a, a singular a, a building style approach where lots of different services are co-located and there was an ability to access a wide range of treatment services. For some communities, the same 
language around community mental health service meant a much more psychosocial approach that was connected to community, that was providing community building services, as well as a safe place to be for a whole range of welfare type supports. And that was the same language. So similar idea translated really different ways, depending on community experiences and needs. Likewise, some different ideas were translated in really similar ways. Um, so the idea of being able to have a tertiary consultation um, and, and be able to access consistency in, say, for example, psychiatry services, there was a lot of really different translation of what that might mean um, in terms of whether you were in a metropolitan area or whether you were in a regional area. Use of really different delivery mediums like technology in one place versus perhaps a, a physical hub in another. Uh, and so it really helped us, and you'll see as I move into uh, the Vision 2030 blueprint, it really helped solidify for us. And it's certainly something that you can see in the, the Productivity Commission's draft report as well, and a lot of other reforms going on at the moment, is that real push for genuine community-based care approaches. Um, and you'll see how we've translated that in a minute. So in the next slide, is just the results of the survey. So we didn't incorporate the survey into the other results. We asked questions slightly differently, which meant we kept them differently, uh, separately, sorry. But I just wanted to kind of include this here to, to highlight, I guess, a consistency between the, the town halls and the survey that we did online for people who weren't able to access those 26 communities. Um, you can see there that uh, affordability is the number one barrier for all respondents. Um, really interestingly there, the next one there is having to repeat your story multiple times, a real sense of fragmentation in, in the services and, and in the um, supports that you're able to access. Um, that trust issue coming up really strongly, fear of what may happen after seeking help and negative experiences in the past. Um, and you can see over there in the principles services and supports that are available in your local community was in fact um, the one given most importance by the people who completed the survey. You can see all of those numbers are really high and that's because people were able to choose as many um, of the principles as, as they wanted and I think you can see there that there is a broad need for a whole range of things uh, that we uh, want to be able to progress in Vision 2030 but it's really interesting for us that services in local community that are designed with and for an individual or carer are the two most significant needs. And you know that, it's, it, this is not new information, but for us, I think it was a really valuable way of starting this process and starting to build Vision 2030. It was really important for us to build 2030 up from that experience. And um, um, I know that Christine and, and the team who went to those town hall meetings uh, really valued being able to hear from people. So, just, I guess, this was a summary of those themes. So this is what we've kind of drawn out as being the key thematic ideas to come from the Connections team. And they cover three kind of different levels. The first one obviously being an individual in their community level, that mental health is not well understood um, and that this still results in, in shame, stigma and discrimination. And that those things stand in the way of people not only being able to identify concerns for themselves and access help when they need it, but actually be able to engage with their communities, engage uh, with things that are meaningful to them and lead, it, and lead a contributing life. Then service delivery. I think we best summarise this as there is significant variability in services capacity to deliver appropriate quality care across the country. We are certainly not saying that there aren't brilliant services out there delivering individually fantastic outcomes for the people who are able to access them, but that there wasn't a consistency to that. And there wasn't a consistency, not only in terms of in all places in, in the country, but in terms of what an individual might need in their community. So services may not have been providing culturally appropriate care. Uh, they may not have been able to access access these services available because of some of those barriers we talked about. Um, or they may have had poor experiences with the only services that are available to them. And lastly, system. So the system itself creates the barriers to identifying need, uh, preventing need and providing quality care that is accessible to everybody. And I think that one is one that Vision really tries to, to focus in on and create a difference um, in terms of the way that you might view a system. 
So what we did was uh, take all of uh, the connections tour and consultations that happened um, and put them together with what was already um, available in terms of long term uh, health plans and the reform activities, the information that was available from there to date, um, along with best research evidence and expertise input. We deliberately separated phase two and phase three out from each other. So in our first step, as Christine mentioned um, earlier, what we were really looking to do is articulate B. Artic if, you were, if you were going from a journey from A, where A is our current system, um, quite often what current reforms, previous reforms have done is, is start from a premise of the incremental improvements to A. What can we do to the system we already have to make that bit a bit better or this bit better? What we wanted to start with here was this is what it should look like at the end. This is all of these components. I want to really acknowledge in, in that before I start talking about those components that a lot of this is uh, part of a, a communication that's been going since the 80s. We know that it's not necessarily that vision components, the things that are in there are all new. Um, we also know that a lot of the things that are in there are already happening, either in some communities or have started. But what Vision's framework tries to do is bring that all together. And we, we do think that that's probably the new piece uh, for policy, is looking at that strategic overarching framework from a perspective of being separate to what current funding is available, what current services deliver who is currently responsible for what in the system. Um, so we deliberately separated that out. And that's the phase two that I'm going to go through. We're not, uh, not acknowledging the importance of that next bit. And so we are going to look at how we get from A to B in the roadmap. And I'll talk about that in a little in a minute. But I just kind of wanted to give that context to the blueprint before I started going through it. So basically, there are kind of four levels in, in the blueprint document. And as I said, you can find that document on the website. So I'm going to try and not go into uh, to spend too much time on some of the bits that you might otherwise be able to uh, read for yourself, but try to uh, give an understanding of why each bit is important and, and what it's aiming to do to try. I guess what we're really trying to do in our webinar today is give you some context uh, to that document um, and really be able to prepare uh, you with some knowledge to be able to engage with what roadmap might look like. So that first piece there is goals. What Vision does is establish goals for a well-functioning, mentally healthy Australia. What does that actually look like? And how do we go about encompassing all of mental wellness and a whole of community, whole of life approach? Um, what do we look like if we're successful? And then once we know that, once we know what our goals are, we need to know how to approach that. And so achieving these goals is going to require new approaches um, or consistently applied new approaches to the way that we address mental well-being in Australia. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what those two are. Uh, we've gone uh, through an integrated wellbeing approach and a balanced community-based care approach. And I'm going to go through what they look like in a minute. And then to achieve those goals and implement new approaches, you need a system. You need a system to deliver the care that is needed. And so Vision proposes a framework of what is needed in a multifaceted, multi-layered system to enable effective care. Um, and I'm going to go through what those components are. And then Lastly, but certainly not least, um, and all kind of moving towards this, is outcomes. And that is that all layers of this system that we have designed to deliver the new approaches that achieve our goals are driven by outcomes, agreed outcomes that are demonstrable and that are able to be reported on and reflected at a national level, at a state level, at a community level, and for the individuals that need care. So. The first is our, our list, if you like, of, uh, of goals, of imagining an Australia. And some of these goals are related to identifying how mental health sits in its context. So we want everybody to be supported to be mentally well. We want to be able to value mental wealth um, and address mental health in its full social context. We want mental health to be well understood and acknowledged as part of everyone's experience. And we want people who are experiencing mental health issues to be respected and, and to be able to live a contributing life without stigma or discrimination. We want people with mental health to be able to have positive life experiences and to reach their potential in whatever way that means for them. 
Um, we want people to be able to suffer less avoidable harm as a result of their mental health concerns. Um, that might be avoidable harm in terms of early mortality from physical health. It might be suicide and self-harm. There are a whole range of uh, particular things that go into um, avoidable harm and we want to be able to see those things reduced. We want communities to be at the centre of being able to identify needs and design responses and deliver care and we want to be able to facilitate that. We want uh, anyone at risk of uh, at risk of or living with a mental health issue to be able to access care affordable evidence-based care in their community. Uh, we appreciate, and you'll see uh, in the following slides, we appreciate that in their community um, requires innovation and requires flexibility and how services are delivered. But we think it's an important premise of the system. We think that it's important to be able to say that everybody should be able to access these things in their community. We want people to be able to play a central role in their care and in the design and delivery of services that support them that mental health is prioritised by all levels and sectors of government and receives parity and respect within the broader health system. And we want services and system, the system successes, <laughs> that was a tongue twister, uh, that are measured based on outcomes with a focus on continuous real time monitoring so that we can actually not only set those outcomes, but measure against them and be able to monitor how they're being uh, achieved so that we can adapt flexibly. So if that's our goals, if that's our objectives, then the next thing we come to are those two new approaches. And so the first one is an integrated wellbeing approach. There are kind of two different components to this. The first is that a wellbeing approach acknowledges and emphasizes that social, emotional, spiritual, cultural, physical, economic, um, and mental wellbeing are all part of the same individual. That they all uh, affect each other, and that they need to be addressed together. It also recognises that mental health is conceptually different, maybe across community groups, cultural groups, um, thinking particularly around the way that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities might conceptualise mental wealth, mental health and mental ill health. But also in terms of age groups, um, knowledge systems are really different around mental health and we need to embrace that and work with it, uh, not exclude it or consider it separate. It is actually part of an integrated wellbeing approach for the whole country. The second side of that is a functional integration. What does it actually look like to create a system that recognises the need for functionally integrated approaches to mental health, physical health and the services provided through social and community welfare to be able to promote wellness and, and enable prevention, but also deliver quality care for those who need it and services that support people. Um, we understand that through that there are some key connection points that we want to be able to look at in a integrated wellbeing approach. So obviously universal and targeted preventions that span all of those things that are focused on mental health, that we are able to connect with physical health outcomes, really acknowledging um, the correlations and the experiences of, of comorbidity around physical health concerns and being able to approach those in an integrated approach as, two, as distinct to two separate issues that we understand the social determinants of mental ill health and address them. That we recognise that there are touch points and entry mechanisms from physical health care and social and human services that should be seamless um, and create early identification and, and um, support for people when they need it. That a person-centred approach requires being able to look at an integrated wellbeing. Um, that you need care coordination across portfolios so that there is a single point of care coordination for people who have complex needs. Um, that there are ways that priority populations might deal, be dealt with in particular different parts of um, social and, and human services that need to be able to access appropriate mental health care. Um, that we need integration across those things in terms of information sharing, practical, you know, interoperable systems. And that you need to be able to overlay those life-saving and crisis supports um, and crisis resolution, particularly as it relates to suicide prevention and, and self-harm um, across all of those things um, in a coordinated fashion. So that's our first approach, a sense of integrated wellbeing. The second new approach, um, and uh, again, appreciating new, uh, it's, uh, in inverted commas at the very least there. But uh, the second approach that we really wanted to be able to explore and promote through Vision 2030 was a sense of balanced community-based healthcare. Now, community-based, the definitions for community-based 
care at the moment, uh, still very much tied to a concept of a particular type of secondary care. Uh, they often describe the bricks and mortar of outpatient treatment. Um, and we believe that that's not a particularly um, encompassing way of looking at community-based mental health care and that an approach to community-based mental health care means that people need to be able to have equitable access um, to care in their own community in the least restrictive environment of possible across the whole spectrum of care um, and that while we're you know enabling safety and recovery we're supporting a person's connection to their community to family culture social supports work and education um, it, with the person at the center of the process it also means that um, that delivery of care is community based um, even across the spectrum in addition to it at a particular point um, in the spectrum so you can see there um, and this table is in the vision 2030 uh, document but you can see there there's kind of four key areas that community-based care can be considered the first one is in the system so that we actually create community-led approaches that facilitate meeting local needs. Um, that includes issues like local control, um, co-design and participation within a community, accessibility and affordability, equity, equity, equity um, resource distribution. And that one resource distribution is really important alongside capacity building and infrastructure. The system component of a community-based mental health care system means that we are considering how you develop communities that are able to do these things, recognising that they need resources, that a system that creates community-based care is more than just the sum of its community-based service parts, but that you actually need to be able to build capacity in a community, whether that's literally the infrastructure of uh, technology in an area or the appropriate buildings or the appropriate structure of governance for health decision making. Um, but those things need to be in place and they need to be in place at the right level in a community. Obviously, there are practice principles. Um, these ones are ones I think so many services um, are already implementing, although obviously, as we saw with uh, our connections data, that's not necessarily consistent. But we want to see people acknowledged and supported in their own context. So that's about autonomy um, and being able to consider your own strengths and goals and what recovery means and have your own goals of person centered care. Um, it means family and carers are engaged um, in care and in the services that are delivered and that it's culturally appropriate. Then there's the delivery of care, as I was talking about. So we're talking about being able to deliver through community-based services across the spectrum with care planning and coordination with community and home-based services across all levels of intervention that could be face-to-face -face or digital or a combination um, community mental health centers continuity of care across services in a local area that's where that sense of a service of care planning and coordination comes in um, enhanced community treatment um, for moderate to high intensity and obviously for crisis resolution services as well and then integration. So we need all of those aspects working together seamlessly uh, behind the scenes so that there is an interoperability. So there's a capacity for navigation and referral and pathways that are on behalf of the system, not on behalf of a person or family or carer on the other side of that navigating their own way through. So you're creating a local community of services in addition to the community that the person's living in. So we have our goals, we have our new approaches. What we need is a system that's going to deliver those approaches. And what this does is identify the key components of that system. As I said at the top, this isn't about saying what specifically we will be doing to implement these things, that is the step that comes next. But this is the piece that identifies what those core components need to be and how we go about creating um, a particular, sorry, a particular structure for the for the system going forwards. So what I'm going to do is go through all of these uh, particular components. This is outlined in quite a lot of detail in the um, document on the website. And so I'm going to try really hard to focus less on the the really significant detail that goes into all of those individual boxes and more on the the why why this particular bit what is the, what is this trying to achieve um, so that we can get a sense of what the purpose of each component is 
First one there, obviously, that we have is the principles. So the idea is that there is a set of principles that are overarching all of Vision 2030. Um, and that includes both the framework and what should be in there and also going forward into the roadmap and how we uh, deliver the Vision 2030 framework. Uh, I, this list is uh, going to be fairly self-explanatory, but I'll go through each one in a little bit of detail. So a social and emotional well-being approach, which is what we've just spoken about in terms of integrated well-being. The recognition of lived experience knowledge, which is central and, um, and not just to uh, being able to create informed decision making um, in all aspects of care, but it's central to policy and planning and practice and participation. Um, equity and equality. So uh, there is a section in Vision 2030 on taking a rights based approach to mental ill health, acknowledging that equality and quality and equity in health is a basic human right for people and what that might look like in terms of implementation. Recognition of the importance of intersectionality. So recognising that people are unique, that the impact of a complex combinations for each person of experiences and identities um, has a huge impact on people's wellness, but also their ability to engage um, with prevention, with services, with care and support, um, with their networks, with their communities, and that you cannot create an effective system by considering people in a compartmentalised way. So that's what our principle around intersectionality addresses. Partnership and collaboration is about uh, across health. It's about sectors and communities. It's about being able to work together and being supported to work together uh, to make the best use of resources and deliver cohesive and coordinated care. Um, and that partnership and collaboration has been considered as a principle very specifically, rather than uh, perhaps using some of that language around whole of government. We really have taken a whole of governance approach in Vision 2030. We want to be able to see partnership and collaboration. That's not just about um, who funds particular parts of a system, but everybody who is involved in decisions, delivery, design of those systems. Obviously the balanced community-based approach that we just spoke about, Flexible solutions, so acknowledging that everything that's in there needs to be able to be responsive and adaptive and outcome focused and relevant to local needs. One of the things that we really translated into the, the pandemic response plan was an idea that while there is a, a national foundation, um, there are flexible local solutions because local needs are different and we've certainly got that in Vision 2030 as well. We have a principle of innovation, so we want to be able to encourage and, and facilitate novel ways of solving problems and acknowledge that problems will emerge and things will adapt. We'll create new products and solutions that better meet people's needs and we need to have a system that can adapt to that. Um, best practice care, obviously, so um, in terms of across the spectrum, uh, that is quality and safe and, and trauma-informed, evidence-based, proportionate, um, we have a recovery oriented approach uh, that acknowledges recovery is non-linear um, and unique to every individual, but an important principle to be considering when you're looking at mental health. And uh, last on that list, obviously, but not least, uh, trauma informed approaches so that um, those are approaches to both care, but also the system that recognise the impact of trauma for individuals and families and communities, both individually and across generations, um, and promote a culture of safety and empowerment and healing. So those are the principles that we're working from in looking at all of uh, Vision 2030. In terms of outcomes and impact, and that being our, our front um, part of the arrow, the thing that we are working towards, you can see there, there's a whole list of what those outcomes might look like. Um, and these are example lists at the moment. The roadmap will include a list of recommended outcomes that um, are sort of connected to uh, what data should be collected, what that measurement, monitoring and evaluation looks like. You can see there that there are some outcomes that are related very specifically to mental illness, um, its rates and recovery and quality of life, um, early help seeking and early intervention. Uh, there's also some things that relate to people's experience um, and socially um, and in terms perhaps connected to quality of life there around increases in housing stability and employment for those with mental illness, um, increases in uh, engagement, improved child development, decreased engagement with corrections, um, decreases in suicide self-harm, 
um, decreases in the use of involuntary and emergency services um, and national attitudes that demonstrate mental health understanding and acceptance. And we look at that in three ways. We look at measurement and monitoring and evaluation. So we look at how we're going to collect that data and we make recommendations on um, national data sets uh, that look at individual outcomes, certainly, but also community outcomes and population outcomes against agreed measures that are linked to the standards of practice. Uh, that we look at monitoring, so actually uh, creating the tools, uh, consistent tools to enable us to create like information that allows us to monitor um, what's happening in terms of implementation, all the way from implementation on agreements of, uh, between governments through to uh, service delivery at an individual level. And that evaluation is, is integrated into the system so that you have program and policy evaluation that's appropriately resourced um, as well as uh, looking at translation and, and that real world effectiveness. In terms of governance structures, so you can see a whole list of things there, um, obviously national agreements and policy and legislation, uh, a sense of coordinated leadership, investment, which in Vision 2030 very much talks about um, parity in terms of funding, looking at investing in social well-being measures, as well as early intervention and prevention. Um, through to a long spectrum of care. Standards and specifications, which you'll see um, from the document, is about creating a, a set of uh, agreed standards uh, and models and tools to enable delivery at a local level, and an actual system for community design and delivery, which goes back to what I was talking about when looking at the uh, community-based care approach in terms of how you resource and create a structure to enable communities to deliver local care. So you can go through in a lot more detail in the uh, in the document to see what we've said under each of those titles. But what I kind of wanted to talk about here is just what the governance structures are designed to do. So they're very much about creating the national foundations for local solutions. Uh, it's a strong basis. Creating consistency and clarity so that uh, roles and responsibilities, if you like, so that the public and services, states and territories and, and the federal government know what to expect and, and what to what they will be delivering. It makes best use of resources. So governance structures um, and the particular components that we've broken them down into uh, are about decreasing duplication, modelling what's needed and allowing flexibility uh, to deliver in different ways in local communities. Um, it's about that sector capacity building, as I just said, so providing support to be able to deliver the community-based system. It's about sustainability. So they're about the system that improves and adapts and innovates um, while minimising negative impacts on people on environment um, and things like that and then recognition so it, it that that sense of leadership and investment is about recognition and the value of mental wealth um, and and looking at mental health in its social context and, and the breadth of a an entire community need as well as individual need the next uh, the green strip in the arrow is is very much about performance enablers things like integrating services, the multidisciplinary workforce, um, research and evaluation, data and information management, priority populations and age streams and funding. So these are the things that are the capabilities, the forces and resources that contribute to the success of the system um, and how those structures work together to facilitate a person-centered approach within the core components of care, which is the next bit we'll look at. Um, like I, as with the governance structures, there's a lot more detail in the document that I really encourage you to look at in terms of what each of those performance enablers looks like. But just a couple of things, I guess, to pull out that are of particular, or maybe of particular interest. Um, in terms of the multidisciplinary workforce, we've taken a very broad view of what that workforce looks like. Vision 2030 focuses very much on the care that is needed, the actions that are needed and the skills that are needed to do it. Not necessarily about particular roles having uh, particular purposes to play at only specific points in the, in the spectrum. It recognises the value of the role that those people play. And so we talk about a multidisciplinary workforce that includes a whole range of um, mental health specific or uh, specialist uh, treatment type um, workforces. It covers frontline workforces. Um, it covers the lived experience workforce and it treats those things um, as an integrated workforce, not as separate streams of a workforce. So Vision 2030 very much is about acknowledging that, you know, there is not a single role that a GP 
plays. There's, there's a, a role for primary care, but there may well be GPs, for example, who have additional training and expertise and interest who may play a whole range of roles in terms of uh, coordination or delivery of some of those uh, general interventions. Likewise, the lived experience or peer workforce isn't just about peer support as a singular box, there are a whole range of valuable ways that that workforce contributes to high intensity care through to prevention. So it's not about uh, as targeting specific professions or specific boxes around what those professions, uh, what those professions are about. Um, but it is about being able to look at that workforce in a, a holistic way. The other one, sorry, I'll go back. The other one there is um, the priority populations and age streams. So again, there's so much more information in, in the document, but putting those things up in uh, performance enablers, so the cap capabilities and forces and, and resources, in addition to the, the core components of care means that they aren't just a particular box in a system. We identify that there are ways that the whole system needs to be able to address people's experiences, um, their uh, identities or their culture, their age, and that those things need to be about the whole system in the way that they, that they are able to engage with everything from those wellness measures through to um, specific specialist treatments. So we identify some priority populations and we talk about what that might mean for those priority populations in the document. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, for example, communities, we've talked very much about needing to have services where there is leadership um, of all service and support and, and capacity building to enable uh, leadership of those services, um, as well as having culturally appropriate um, supports and, and really integrating that across the whole spectrum rather than having a particular core component of care that is just, we provide services to this particular group. Likewise with age streams, we've broken the system down into children, uh, young adults, uh, general adults and older Australians. And so we've said that for each of those age streams, there needs to be consideration of how each of the core components of care uh, need to be delivered and how they will be addressed from right from governance through to delivery mediums. Uh, and, and I guess that was one of the, the really key things for us was to identify that as being separate to a particular component of care. So these individual boxes are the components of care. These are the things that we're saying are the essential groups of supports and interventions. I know that the words in these boxes are really like a broad words and they do in the document cover a whole range of different types of services that might uh, fall under that particular title. We've got wellbeing measures and primary health care and community and allied services right across the top there, acknowledging um, how important they are as particular components of care within a mental health system. You can see there that there's a, a whole range of, so, you know, right from prevention um, through psychoeducation and self-guided care, screening and assessment. These are things that you would uh, most likely understand and perhaps don't even look that different to something that you might have seen in the community right now. But there's a couple here I just thought I'd pull out quickly. One's the box that says connection and coordination because that identifies a specific core component of care that is about creating a sliding scale of intervention that allows people to navigate through one service system, to be able to navigate to the supports they need, connect with services seamlessly without having to retell their story or go to different services in a local community, um, right through to a really complex care planning and coordination that I was talking about earlier that allows for uh, people with complex needs to have coordination across many factors in their life. The other boxes that might be of interest that might look slightly different to perhaps some of the other things that you've seen before is the box on crisis resolution. So that's very much about us acknowledging the need for a dedicated, non-hospital um, connected uh, crisis resolution services from an early intervention through to community-based emergency responses, 24 hour safe places to go, uh, outreach services, emergency responder services that are mental health specific through to assertive aftercare um, and outreach and postvention, uh, regardless of whether or not you've been through the hospital system. So a dedicated uh, component there. 
And then a dedicated component that actually looks at carer and family supports, acknowledging that while carer and family have a huge role to play across all of those components of care and the treatment that people might receive, that they actually have their own needs and that they should be able to be addressed um, and supported and have their own uh, supports separate to supports that the person that they're caring for might need. Um, and so that's in its own dedicated box for that reason. And you can read a little bit more about that in the document. So this is the framework. It's the framework for planning, for coordinating from national through to state and territory or regional and, and local services to say these are all the building blocks. This is what needs to happen. And they're directed as building blocks and not a map in this point because they are all connected and they all need to be delivered. Um, and how they get delivered or how they are combined uh, should be a matter for, for what works best to create the most local services that we possibly can. And create individual personalised connections and coordination. So that's what that looks like in a stepped care model. And really, this is exactly the same. This is in the document, so I won't go through this in too much detail. But it's just to highlight there that you've got the, um, the support to lead a healthy life socially and emotionally, support to help care for someone with mental health concerns, and life-saving and crisis supports added to that concept of stepped care. And that it really is kind of creating it into a, a more uh, spectrum that focuses on a person's whole journey, uh, works on preventing illness progression and promoting recovery and, and allows people to move seamlessly um, with a, a, you know, the tools required within the system to create continuous monitoring and assessment and, and feedback and things like that. So this is what this looks like as an example of a system and a journey. You'll see here that there aren't any arrows between these boxes. And that's because, as I just said in, in the one earlier, that really those arrows go through all these boxes um, and connect everywhere. And it's actually a lot easier to read what's in the boxes when those arrows aren't uh, actually attached to it. But what this shows is that there are integrated universal services um, that are for everybody, the, the whole of community in terms of prevention, screening, um, that navigation service, um, so that there, there are touch points for everybody around their mental health and promoting mental wellness. That there are uh, integrated front door services, if you like, things that people can access for themselves, whether that's been identified through screening and assessment or primary care, connection and navigation, or identified by a person themselves, that they have access to those things like uh, self-guided interventions and the care planning and coordination and that that care planning and coordination leads down into individualized packages of, of specialized care as needed with those support services crossing the journey um, for both care and family and, and for the person with ill health and that centralized sense of coordination um, so you've got those kind of four different types of services all working together around both a, an integrated universal service and then a an individualized package and, and specialized care with a whole range of front doors to allow self-directed uh, entry and, and support as well as coming through those other support services so this is just an example of what that might look like um, drawn to kind of uh, show not so much a journey, I think journey is probably optimistic, but showing how those things might work together in a community um, for a community, uh, all people, and then for individuals. And then the last little box in the arrow is the delivery mediums. So how things will actually get delivered. It's very uh, specific that we've uh, kept this separate to the core components of care. Quite often, I think the uh, that services are actually defined by, funded by the uh, delivery medium that they use. Uh, and we really wanted to be able to say that the, you have a range of services, a range of components of care that need to be delivered. And then there are multiple flexible ways that you could deliver that that might be appropriate to an individual or it might be appropriate to a community. Um, so this is the kind of sites of service. You can see there's educational workplace, digital, uh, home and flexible, community mental health hubs, community co-locations, which you'll see from the document includes uh, private practitioners and, and things like that, as well as local actual community locations, community centres, for example, uh, residential and hospital. Um, and that core components of care might be grouped into these things. Um, so for example, community mental health hubs, um, but likewise, you might have different types of service, specialized care delivered in different ways, residential or, or you know, home or digital, depending on the location that you're in and that that's important and should be able to be flexible. Um, and that services should have that flexibility to do things differently, to be able to deliver as close to community as possible.
so basically this i guess is kind of the 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 summation of the things that, that all of that is trying to say. The Vision 2030 is about mental wealth being valued and central to investment, um, that there's a coordinated effort to prevent, identify and intervene early with ill health, that support services are accessible alongside all levels of intervention, um, that services needed are planned and coordinated centrally in sustainable, flexible packages, that services are affordable and available in your community and a system that delivers what is needed, right? And it's that system bit that I think is really crucial for Vision 2030. I think that we really have looked at um, this from a perspective of so much is already there, so much gets duplicated, so much uh, has opportunities but isn't scaled or is piloted and not retried, so much is around the way that services are delivered and the system that actually creates the governance and the responsibilities, the standards, the funding um, and the workforce to enable those things to happen. So Really quickly, the next phase is roadmap. This is where we're up to. Roadmap is going to be our next piece of this puzzle. And it's going to connect those key system components to current activity, the drivers of change and, and priorities for action, things that are already happening in terms of uh, reform and setting priorities to plan a way forward. So integrating the key processes in the mental health reform going on right now, um, identifying gaps where those reform processes haven't necessarily addressed all of the key components of Vision 2030 um, and exploring those through policy and legislation, services, outcome measurement and funding mechanisms to enable us to move forwards. Roadmaps really going to be able to look at not only uh, the things that might be new or those gaps, but also all of the recommendations that are being made um, or have come out of reform now and, and recently to say, what are the overarching priorities? What can be done immediately or must be done first? Um, and what is kind of dependent on earlier change? So, you know, if you would like to see um, increased services in, in rural or remote, what are the things that need to happen before then in terms of workforce, in terms of funding, um, in terms of technological infrastructure to enable those things to happen. So, so what is the sequencing, if you like, um, and how do the current forms and recommendations work towards all of this in a kind of coordination and overarching uh, the compass, if you will, to the, the many things that have been um, put forward to enable us to kind of make sense of them, bring them together, see how they're meeting what we want to have happen in the future and identifying how we get those done in, in the immediate term and then the medium term and then the long term. So, so far what we've, we've got uh, for a roadmap is, is all of the, the aspects of Vision 2030. We've looked at them um, through those drivers that I've just been talking about, the opportunities for change. Obviously, some of the opportunities for change are also aspects of vision, so I haven't included there things like research um, or uh, governance. Um, legislation is in there under policy, we've got funding models, things like communication. So what are the drivers, the opportunities for change? And then looking at the roadmap, putting together those current circumstances and the objectives of Vision 2030, what are the opportunities and the actions, where are the priorities and what should be our way forwards? We've got an advisory committee that is has been working on that with us. We've uh, consulted expertise, so we've had some additional special uh, meetings with the advisory committee and additional um, invitees to look at some of the specific issues related to Vision 2030 alongside research. We've been doing some additional projects specifically, for example, on looking at drug and alcohol and how that connects to uh, the mental health system um, and workforce uh, on the uh, funding models. So we've been doing some additional work there to pull together what the key concepts for the roadmap might be. And we've been putting that together with all of the consultation that's already gone into a really overwhelmed reform space at the moment. We know that the, you have been giving so much of your experience and your time and your expertise to so many of the different processes that are going on at the moment. Um, and we have listened and we have taken that on board so that we can take the feedback that you've given to those things. So the, the public submissions, for example, through Productivity Commission and the Royal Commission, uh, the connections to other projects that the National Mental Health Commission are doing. So the peer workforce or lived experience workforce guidelines, the pandemic plan, 
all of the consultation that went into those particular pieces have also informed Vision 2030. And now what we really want to be able to move forward with though, is take an opportunity to work with you on how we prioritise the key concepts that have been coming out of Roadmap. So we're going to be working towards that. How do we make sense of this, put this together, put it together with the reform recommendations so that they all create a coordinated piece of strategy going forwards. Um, and that's where we're going to be going with our next consultation steps. And we really want to take you along with us. So that's us uh, in I know a nutshell it's such a whistle stop tour and there is a lot more detail in the document um, and we're always happy to answer questions and that is where we have got to now we've got about 15 minutes to answer questions so Karina I don't know if you want to turn videos back on so that people can see Christine and I um, while we answer some questions Great. And I'm off Excellent. to you as well. Okay, great. So the first question that I've got here, and I do appreciate there's a lot of questions that people have asked, and um, I know that we won't get to all of them. So I will uh, up front say that if we don't get to your question, we will do our best to answer it in the frequently asked questions. But the first question that I've got um, is, how will uh, Vision make help seeking more straightforward? And look, I have an answer to this that is uh, technical and ironically uh, not straightforward. But Christine, is there anything that you would like to talk about, it, perhaps around that sense that you got from connections around coordination and navigation and, and talk about help seeking there before I launch into my technical yeah. answer? For sure. Thank you. Look, um, that is one of the most critical things that we actually want to try and ensure. So what we've seen, if I could just put, try and, and put this in a context for people, this very detailed work that we're doing in Vision 2030 is to say, if you imagine that the, um, that the system is almost like the foundations on which a house is built, and the, the changes and the foundational pieces we're looking at doing here are to say, what are those bits of it that we need to get right? So then what we can do is to create an experience for people which seems to work so much better for you. So if we put all these system changes in, then you should be able to firstly have a much better understanding of what, what kind of are the things that the system provides for me. It, does it provide supports? Does it provide psycho psychological help in community if I need it? What are the things I need? And if I'm not sure what I need, I'm pretty clear where I can go. I can go to a GP, I can go to other places, and they will actually really help first understand what it is I'm facing. Secondly, with a lot more clarity than we have at the moment, actually say, these are the five things you could do. These are the five places you could go and actually help you get there a lot more quickly because the whole thing will kind of be linked together in the right way. And what we're looking to do is strip out a lot of all of that duplication and all of those challenges about finding the right person and make it really, if you like, user friendly. So lots of detail goes into making something that then seems to be really simple to use. So the short answer is, yes, it will be a lot easier, not only to find what you need, but also to have that upfront experience of help me understand what I need so that I can then find it more easily. So Francis, you might want to put some technical things behind it, but I think that's really the whole, whole thing we're looking at doing here. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I mean, I, I, the irony of the fact that my answer is, is not straightforward um, when they are asking the question about straightforward help seeking is, is not lost on me. But I guess there are three different ways that we look at, at making help seeing, seeking a more straightforward process um, in Vision 2030. There's the kind of front end, the experience of you interacting with a sector uh, or a system that is about the core components of care, right? So it is about the things that you've just talked about, centralised care coordination and planning. It's about creating a point, singular points of navigation so that there are places that you can go. It's about creating those screenings through uh, universal touch points at different points in the lifespan so that uh, people are able to help you recognise and guide you through into help seeking um, at those particular points um, in life. Then there's the kind of behind the stage 
the, the back end of, of what that looks like. So it's about a trained frontline workforce that are able to understand uh, and identify concerns with you and help you navigate that pathway and referral pathways between services. And then in that very back end, in that system piece that Vision 2030 looks at, it is about that interoperability. So how is it that we create an environment where the, the information goes before you rather than you having to, to cut it forwards, that the system is helping you, is identifying for you the next piece that might be most useful for you rather than you having to identify it yourself out of the ecosystem of, of things that might be available to you. So I think Vision kind of looks at help seeking not as one thing, but as the different components that work towards better help seeking. So the next question, uh, Christine, I think you might want to uh, work with me on this one um, is around vision 2030 uh, being a collaborative effort the question is around whether it's nonpartisan and and is this about uh, the idea of vision being something that could be taken forward and continue to be implemented regardless of what might be going on uh, politically oh really good question and yeah absolutely land that one straight away this is about a a mental health and suicide prevention system so a system is not political. What I believe is political is what services are supported and, and those kind of issues. What we're doing here is creating an underlying system that actually works better. That as Francis has said, and I think actually that was a really good way to talk about it, Francis, it was about um, how can we actually understand better your needs with the screening and all of those entry points? How can we understand better what the components are and how do we make and how do we help you navigate them? And how do we actually make a system that is interoperable and makes that work behind it? And when you're looking at doing that, you're not so much looking at how much am I going to invest in service X or service Y, which can sometimes be where the, the political realities might, uh, might appear to be. So I actually believe it is bipartisan, but just to test that out, we are taking it, as I said, to all of the jurisdictions. We're liaising with all the jurisdictions, with all stakeholders. So we're really um, bringing it down to that level where we say, would this work for you, irrespective of the politics? Absolutely. So the next question that I've got is around um, the social uh, the social determinants of of health and and how um, those sit behind uh, suicide, self harm, um, and what is Vision twenty thirty going to do a, a, about those like how does that connect i can talk about um vision 2030 sort of the integrated well-being approach a little bit but um did you want to add anything to that before i start christine maybe perhaps from both of the hats that you wear with suicide prevention sure look and, and i think it's a really critical point because we know that our mental health and well-being and our protection from the the challenges of suicidal ideation and risks really sits within those social determinants um, our economic security, our housing security, our education, the impact of trauma, all of those kind of things do actually impact on our mental health and wellbeing and impact on when we may not be well. The challenge, I think, from a mental health perspective is to do two things. One, maybe three, but one is to understand the role of those social determinants. So not to take what we would call a medicalized view about our mental health challenges and be too diagnostic, but rather understand that those challenges happen within a construct where social issues, social determinants, our housing, our education, et cetera, are impacting on us. So understanding it. Where there are challenges and things that are causing a negative impact on our mental health and wellbeing, it's critical that our system understands that the expertise to address those issues is needed. If, for instance, we're going through financial challenges, mental health experts are not financial experts. They understand the need for you to have that financial security. We need to have a system that connects so that that person can get the help they need with that. But we are the system, we are the place to hold you and to hold the mental health challenges that arise from that and to, to help you navigate those issues. So they're incredibly connected. They're, it's incredibly important they're understood, particularly at those entry points, so that we don't have a medicalised diagnostic. 
it's we're not there to solve those particular issues in and of themselves, but we know we know they impact, and we know we have to help people navigate through them. So it's it's a challenging space to be, um, because it's not like uh, physical health where it's much more um, kind of you can quantitatively assess it, but it is a it's a it's a place which really sits within Vision 2030. So did you want to pick up on that, Francis? Yeah, and I guess, I mean, it, it kind of almost falls along the same lines as, as the last question in terms of there being some things about the approach. So the integrated wellbeing approach that really emphasises those social and emotional um, connection points and, and the equitable impact of, yeah. of those on risk, um, as well as mental health and looks at it as a whole system. And we talked a bit about that. I think some of the system measures within Vision 2030 uh, really highlight that as well. So the fact that we actually have put in that really large requirement around population wellbeing measures um, and created that connection to community as part of mental wellness. And I think those really go to what isolation looks like and, and the wellness of a community as a whole. Um, and an investment in those. I think that's a really key part of, if you look at those governance structures and that sense of investment. I think the things that you've been just talking about, Vision really highlights that as, as being a need um, for, for funding, for support. It's, it's where we're investing in the system. And then I think the fact that the service, the, the core components of care, I think, we've really tried to create a, a holistic support structure there, that it's not um, just around particular services for mental um, ill health, that it is about those social supports being available across the spectrum. And that includes things like social isolation. It includes connection um, for people. And that crisis resolution services too, aren't just about in the moment, that where we talk about crisis resolution as, as a core component of care, we also talk about an ongoing um, connection so that that aftercare is integrated for people. And that's not just necessarily created um, in a hospital space, but that's actually um, within community that those things go forwards in connecting people to community and reducing risk um, after. Uh, so I think, yeah, so that's kind of, that's the way Vision might look at it from a, a technical individual components perspective. Um, one of the other questions that we've got here uh, is uh, probably a question of clarification. So I'll have, I'll have a go at this one. Um, it says uh, that communities are a centre of identifying needs, designing responses and delivering care. Surely the consumers and carers should be at the centre. And um, that is absolutely correct. Um, when we've talked about communities being at the centre of identifying need and designing and delivering responses, what I guess we mean is that um, bigger picture of everybody being part of that we would absolutely see that consumers and carers should be integral in that the consumers and carers in a community are part of that community we see stakeholders in terms of you know the, the kind of stakeholder pyramid going from governance all the way through to to communication and informed decision making consumers and carers should absolutely be at the center of all of those aspects um, right from governance through to design and delivery the reason that we've said communities should be at the center of identifying their needs and designing responses is because we do want that to be collaborative um, and we do want it to be a piece of the puzzle that includes all of those things so that might include the services available in a community alongside consumers and carers um, who are also part of that community it might be particular uh, cultural communities within a location it might be particular services that are outside of the mental health system that are in that community there are a whole range of pieces of a puzzle that go into a community and all of those things should be part of identifying needs and designing responses and delivering care but um but our uh a representation of that in, in this presentation is absolutely not to say that consumers and carers should not be at, at the center of that planning process um so i hope i hope that clarifies that a little bit christina i don't know if there's anything that you want to add i guess in terms of consumer and, and care participation in that sense but no other than i think you've said it and if i had to just kind of really put it really in just distilling that right down communities comprise consumers and carers you're at the core of your community, you're at the core of identifying the needs. Yes, there are service providers and others within the community, but you're at the core of it. Absolutely. So uh, let me just double check time. Okay, we've got two more minutes, but we might just go for, a, we'll go for two, two more questions. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a question there that's around um, person-centred. So, so what makes this person centered um, and I actually think that's a really good question because I think 
I think that currently the system is very uh, front loaded, if you like, around person centred. There is a lot of requirement on individuals, on the person and, you know, the consumer or the carer to create person centred, on services to be person centred in the way that they deliver care or they plan care. One of the things that Vision really tries to do is build up that behind the scenes structure to person centred, so that it is not the person or the individual service on their own doing an effort to create a person centred approach, but that all of those pieces that we've just talked about in terms of uh, centralised coordination and care planning, integration of pathways, informed decision making and choice, so having that diversity locally, person centred funding models that allow for that diversity, that, that local design and delivery, so consumers and carers being involved in their community in designing services that are available within their community. I think those are the things that vision really needs to build, that the current system really needs to build to create a person-centered system. So that it's not just um, the work of individuals and the services that are delivering perhaps a person-centered care in their service, but that actually the whole system is designed to coordinate that way so that people are able to develop their own pathway to create models that work for them in terms of which particular pieces of service they needed at any given moment in a longitudinal and uh, coordinated way that is individualized that's funded to be individualized. Um, so I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add to that, Christine. No, I think that was no, that's good. Excellent. And so look, the last the last question isn't really a question, um, but I can I've, I've kind of been sort of scrolling through some of the other questions that we haven't uh, got to. And I can see that there's there's a lot of there's a lot of really good, really good questions that are about people's own experience. Um, there are a lot of questions that are quite specific around maybe perhaps what might happen for the care that you currently provide or the service that you currently access. Um, and I can I can really appreciate that it can be really challenging to see those things in a service level uh, framework. Um, and that what we would hope is that even if you can't necessarily see those specific things now, and maybe not even potentially once we've got to the end of roadmap, what Vision is trying to do is create a system that will address those needs, that has that flexibility of funding, of care coordination, of the particular packages of service that are available, that include a whole range of, of workforces, that even though we haven't been able to address your specific uh, circumstances and, and things that are so incredibly important to you in your life, um, that we will be working towards a system that will be able to do those things. And um, it is now the end of time. So, Christina, I might actually hand to you to see if there's anything that you want to add on that point to kind of finish us up then. Thank you for that. And I think I would just add on to that just to go back to the comments I made a few minutes ago. This seems so complex and so detailed. The reason it is, is because if we really want to set the foundation for getting things right for the next decades, then we actually need to make sure that those really foundational pieces that we do to, that actually require, that drive, that make it not negotiable, that we have a system that really understands what it is that you need and then enables you to reach that in the most straightforward, integrated, and affordable way possible requires this detail underneath so it can be simple on top. So um, as Francis has said, if we started going through the lens of particular services, then all we're really doing is looking at just what's happening at the moment and just rearranging the deck chairs. And the whole purpose of Vision 2030 is that we go deeper than that and make those foundational changes that will ensure that this is right for time to come. So thank you. It, it, um, we understand, Francis, that these um, slides or this information is available for people on the website if they want to go in and have another look at it. Yeah, so it absolutely will be. We'll pop the slides and the, the recording of today's session up on the website. And I, you know, there were so many questions that we didn't get to. I can see some really good questions in there around disabilities and human rights. Um, what we will do is we'll take those questions. We might synthesise a couple of them where similar questions have been asked, um, but we'll take those questions and we'll, we'll pop them into a frequently asked questions that goes up with the, uh, the slides and 
the uh, video from today as well. So we'll try to get you some, some answers there. So look, thank you so much, Christine. And then thank you so much everybody for joining us. Um, and I really encourage you all to continue being involved with us to participate in the next step. That is the uh, perhaps harder work of how do we get from A to B and what are the priorities uh, that we wanna set there. Um, and you can do that by signing up to the interest register or email the team that you can see on the email address there. Um, so yeah, thank you so much everybody for joining us. You'll see that the webinar is going to stay open for just a minute or two um, now that we've closed so that the team can make sure that they captured all of your comments and questions. So it will be up for just one or two minutes more, but, um, but that's us done for the day. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you.